Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm very pleased to have John Wood here, who is the founder of Room to Read and author of two books, um, Leaving Microsoft to Change the World, which he came to Google before and spoke uh, for a book tour, and for his latest book, Creating Room to Read. Um, we have copies in the back um, for all of you who want to get your own version. Um, but um, I was very excited to have John here because Room to Read has been a charity that I have personally supported. And um, I think he's done some really amazing things. So um, as he mentioned in his title of his book, he did leave Microsoft. Um, he uh, did change the world in a lot of different ways. And in just 10 years, he has opened up 1,600 schools, right? 15,000 libraries, he has distributed 12 million books, and he has reached 7.8 million children, and he works in Bangladesh, Cambodia, India, Laos, Nepal, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Tanzania, Vietnam, and Zambia. Um, so that's a really impressive list of accomplishments, and um, John wound up doing this somewhat by I don't know if it's by accident, um, but I'd like John to come up and I'm gonna ask him some questions about his story and his book and um, then I'll open it up to the rest of you to hear your questions. So, um, so let's welcome John. All right, so. Um, it's always amazing that nobody wants to sit in the front row. Everybody, yeah. All these empty chairs in the front row. It's, yeah, I was going to... There we go. We got one, we got one couple, yeah. at least one taker. Yes, at least one taker. And uh, future people who will come, we'll have them sit in the front, too. Okay, they're we'll penalty. Call, we'll call them out as soon as they come in the back door um, to come into the front. Oh, look, more, more people in the front. Oh, you got to sit in the front row. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so let's uh, maybe just start from the beginning, yeah, if we can. Um, I was born in... No. Yeah. <laughs> So I, this happens to me too, where people ask me to repeat my story. But it, it is really interesting, and I'd like everyone to hear. Uh, how is it that you wound up, like being at Microsoft? You know, similar to probably a lot of people here in the room, you are a marketing manager for APAC yeah. at Microsoft, um, thinking about changing the world with software, and then all of a sudden you something happened, and your life took a totally different course. Yeah, I, I joined Microsoft in 1991. I was two years out of grad school, did my MBA, really had no business being there. I don't know if any of you ever wake up in the morning and you kind of feel like, oh my gosh, like I really don't know that I really belong in this hyper smart environment. I definitely felt that way when I joined Microsoft in 91. And um, by 98, I was a little bit burned out, you know, the whole seven year itch thing after seven years of, you know, way too many meetings and uh, way too many, uh, you know, flights and stuff like that. I decided to go off to Nepal and do an 18 day trek. Uh, just to kind of clear my head and get away from it all, the Annapurna circuit. There's actually a rumor that if you went high enough in the Himalayas, you could escape the sound of Steve Ballmer's voice. And um, <laughs> I decided to, you know, give 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 that a, give that a shot. No, I I, I love I love working for Steve. I learned a lot uh, under him. But um, when I was on day two of my trek, I met a headmaster who wanted to show me his school. It was a really ramshackle, you know, dilapidated school, dirt floors, no desks, 80 children crammed into a room that probably should not have held more than 20. And then he um, said, well, come see the school's library. And I thought, oh, this will be the exciting, optimistic part of the story. How many of you were library nerds as kids? You work at Google, so that's probably a fairly safe question. <laughs> um, so I was like a total library nerd as a kid. So I thought this would be the exciting part of the tour. Kids with smiles on their faces reading books. Eh, totally wrong. Empty room. Completely devoid of children's books. And I asked the headmaster, how can this be? You have 450 kids showing up. They want to learn. And um, their parents want them to learn. And the headmaster said, well, in Nepal, we're too poor to afford education. But until we have education, we will always remain poor. And that just hit me like a ton of bricks as being the cruelest possible catch-22 that you have these kids who are five years old or six years old or seven, year old, seven years old, and they're being told you've lost the lottery of life. And thankfully, the headmaster, like me, was an action-oriented optimist. He said, perhaps, sir, you will someday come back with books. And I thought this would be a great reason to make an annual leave from Microsoft and come back to Nepal and trek. So I was like, yep kind of selfish motivation to sign up. But I'm kind of joking a little bit with the selfish motivation. I grew up in a town, small town, 
that was very middle class. We had a great school library, and we had a great community library that had been built in 1896. So I thought, well, here's, here's my pay it forward. I'll thank the world for my libraries with one library, and didn't realize we wouldn't really stop there. But I went back a year later with 3,000 donated books on the back of six rented donkeys, and my 73-year-old father in tow as my unpaid right-hand man, and it just felt really good. And I said, well, that was fun. Like, maybe we'll keep doing it. And that's really the, that was the point of departure. It was that trip in 99, uh, returning and seeing the smiles on the faces of the kids who had never seen brightly colored children's books before. Uh, the library shelves were suddenly full. And that's the moment I started to kind of edge my way to the door of Microsoft to think maybe my next act will not be in tech. Maybe it will be in something a bit more basic. It's like you read the numbers here and you think like 7.8 million children whose lives you've touched. Like, do you have any stories or like kids that really touched you um, in particular? Like you saw them, you saw they learned something, you saw that they got access to this book. Like, yeah. I mean, how, how, like what, what is that experience for like, you know, one of those 7.8 million kids and how does it really change their life? To be able to have the books and the libraries. And yeah. It's pretty amazing to meet these kids. I hope one day all of you get a chance, you know, including you, you're always welcome to come visit our projects. You know, with 1,600 schools and 15,000 libraries, there's lots of places um, to go visit and meet the kids and meet the, not just kids, but the parents and the grandparents whose lives are being changed. And I'll tell you a story about a student, but first I'll tell you a story about being in Nepal with a number of our chapter leaders who are running fundraising chapters all over the world. We're very entrepreneurial, so we've actually given birth to 57 fundraising chapters around the world, 12,000 people involved. Um, they have not quit their day job to go change the world. They've kept their day job, but they're changing the world through raising um, funds for Room to Read, including our San Francisco chapter. Uh, but the um, Tokyo chapter co-founder, Susan Lodge, was with me uh, on this trip. And Susan would told a story about being in a village where we had a lot of girls in our long-term girls education program. And it's, you know, as you and I both know from our discussions, it's depressingly inexpensive to change a girl's life through education. It's $250 per girl per year. And so the fact that over 100 million girls in the developing world woke up this morning and did not go to school is, to me, just an absolutely avoidable tragedy because it's not an expensive problem to fix. But Susan said to me, John, you've got me, Room has got me forever because I just was talking to a grandmother and she was holding my hand and with tears in her eyes she said, I can die now that I know that my granddaughter is going to get educated. And Susan said, you know, you got a fan for life. So there's the grandmother. We watch parents. And everything we do at Room to Read is under a challenge grant model. The idea is you can't help people if they don't want to help themselves. So we don't go into a village and build them a library or build them a school. You know, hey, step aside, local people. We're here to yeah. help you. Um, we say we're going to help you, but we, only if you want to help yourself. So the parents will put in sweat equity to each project. So I've watched these parents at school openings, at library openings, where the mothers will come up and say, you know, I, they'll point down to the river. That's a pretty steep decline and they'll say, I carried the, the sandbags from the river up. And then other parents, the fathers will say, well, I helped to dig the foundation. So it's very much of a self-help model. And those parents motivate me, right? Because parents everywhere are the same. They want their kids to have a better life than they've had. And it almost always comes down to education. If you can only bequeath one thing to your child, you probably would want to bequeath education. Um, but to land the plane to your question with the students, one of my favorite stories of a student I met with last summer, uh, my father decided for his 86th birthday he wanted to go to Zambia with me on a trip that I was doing. And I, I love my parents. They're, they're such adventurous people. And um, we were <laughs> in this little village uh, in rural Zambia, and I met a kid named Jairus. He's a 13-year-old student and really well-read. He has a room to read library in his school, and he was very articulate and welcoming me to the library. And officially, he was, he was like the head of the welcoming committee that was welcoming our delegation. And I talked to him afterwards. And I said, Jairus, you seem like a very smart young man. And he said, yes. <laughs> and I said, what would you like to be when you grow up? And Jerry said, oh, I will be the first Zambian to be Secretary General of the United Nations. <laughs> and I said, OK, that's great. So you're learning a lot in your library about leadership. And he said, yes, but I've also learned that I will have to do other things along the way. That will not be my first job. <laughs> I said, OK, what would be like an interim kind of lily pad you would jump to on the way to that side of the pond? And I, he said, well, I, would, I will first be president of Zambia. <laughs> and I, it's kind of a funny story, right? So this was, this was in July last summer. Well, in October, a couple of months later, at the United Nations, I was a guest of Gordon Brown, who's running this amazing Education First initiative for Ban Ki-moon. And Ban Ki-moon was telling a story about growing up in post-war South Korea in a village that had been decimated by the war. They were learning outside. The teacher had a stick. 
was drawing in the dirt. That was their chalkboard. They had no books. And Von Kiemen said, then one day, these books showed up. And we were really excited. My parents said to me, you must read every one of those books. And he said, and we opened them up on the inside front cover. It says, a gift from the United Nations. Anybody getting chills now just thinking about that fact that the kid in the village with the stick and the dirt and donated books is now Secretary General of the United Nations. So I don't think Jairus' story is really that far-fetched. And when I, when I think of it, I think about you know, one of my heroes, Nelson Mandela. What would South Africa look like today had Nelson Mandela not been one of the lucky few black South African kids to get educated in that era? What if Mwangari Matai had not had education? The Green Belt movement in East Africa would not have happened. All these kids are out there, right? We're all born with the same gray matter. So if we can just reach them at a young age, I think those Jairus stories, I mean, Jairus could be the next Ban Ki-moon. We'll never know. We'll never know unless we try to reach every one of them. If we don't reach them, we know it won't happen. But if we don't try, we'll never know. So is that a goal of yours, to reach every one of them? Ultimately, I yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, not just room to read, right? I mean, yeah. if the, the greatest things that happen in human history happen when there's a movement. But movements have to have, you know, you got to have the lead sled dogs. <laughs> and you got to have, like, a lot of sled dogs to pull the sled. But we hope to be one of the lead sled dogs. Yeah. And our, our, you know, our interim, our interim goal was originally to reach 10 million children across the poorest parts of the world by 2020. As you know, because I know yes. that you read all the yeah. investor reports we send you diligently, uh, we're actually on track to reach 10 million children five years early by 2015. And to be clear, we don't have, you know, we're not a movement of billionaires. Where they're welcome, but we're, it's not like we're not, <laughs> we're not a top-down model. We don't have, you know, celebrities involved, but it's just ordinary average people who are coming together. We've reached 7.5 million kids already. We'll reach 10 million kids by 2015. Um, and then from there, it's, I want to start sentences with the words every child. Right? Every child gets a chance to read. Every child gets a habit of reading. Every, every girl child gets to go to school alongside the boys. Because in the developing world today, about 40% of girls don't go to school. Right? And that's just, that's just a shame. So ultimately, we want to reverse the notion that any child can ever be told again, you were born in the wrong place, at the wrong time, to the wrong parents, and you therefore did not get educated. We think that notion belongs in a scrap heap of history. It might take 30 or 40 years to get it there, but boy, if we could do that, that's like the whole Archidemies, give me a lever long enough and I can move the earth. That would be, I think, earth moving. Will be. Will be. Definitely. Earth no, it will. It definitely will. Um, so maybe you can tell us a little bit, like, you know, so I understand you started one school, like sort of, you know, by accident, you went there, you thought like, oh, I'll just go there on my annual trek. But then you actually wound up creating, um, you know, 1,600 schools and 15,000 libraries. So, like, how did that happen? How did it happen that you went from one to a lot? And what was, like, maybe tell us a little about scaling. Like, at Google, yeah. we're really good about scale. And yeah. I think one of the things that's been really impressive about you is you've been able to take something that you did once and actually scale it many, many times. So, yeah, how yeah. did that happen? I think that to really explain it, I have to make sure I just use the word we as yeah. often as I can yeah. because I've always said I don't want to be the leader of an organization. I want to be one of many, many, many leaders of a global movement. So that requires you to, A, hire smart, um, B, recruit volunteers in a really, really smart manner, you know, delegate, 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 right? Founders have a duty to get out of the way with certain things that they do well and don't do well. And if you ask me my team, they can probably give you a really long list of the stuff that I don't do very well. Uh, one of the things that I happen to do well, according to my board, is I'm a good rainmaker, and they think I'm a decent public speaker, and they think I'm pretty good with the media. So about five years ago, I faced the choice of, do you want to be CEO, or do you want to backfill that position and go be a full-time ambassador? And I write in a book about that, right? Because, I mean, no, no founder's journey is done until they actually kind of extract themselves you know, from that position. And so that was, for me, a tough thing. But one of my mentors, a banker at Goldman Sachs, he said, look, the minute you're not CEO, what are you going to do? It's like, you're going to get your butt on a plane. You're going to fly around the world. You're going to raise money. You're going to speak. You're going to raise money. You're going to speak. And the Earth's going to spin faster the more times you can circle it, telling the room to read story and encourage people to get along, to get, to get involved. So I think for me, um, we have a great CEO, Erin Ganju, like me, a business person, ex-Goldman, ex-Unilever, brilliant woman. She's hired out a management team, so we can get a lot more done because of that. Um, but I think for us, a lot of it was just kind of, you know, it's like the law of, you know, just compounding. We, we said, let's, let's do 10 libraries our second year, then let's try to do 40, and let's try to do 100, and let's try to do 1,000. And it just, I don't know that there's any secret sauce to it. A lot of it for us is just the execution. 
a lot of it is not being shy about asking for funding, right? Because, I mean, how many of you know an NGO that you love that's perpetually cash-strapped? Like, right, right, like every one of us, right? So a lot of the NGO world, though, they treat, I think they treat fundraising as kind of a yeah. dirty little side business that they have to be kind of embarrassed about. And we're not at all. We just, I love going out and telling people, you know, Katie's here. When Katie was at the University of Miami and they had me come speak, Miami of Ohio, the colder but better Miami. Um, <laughs> no offense to our friends in Florida. Um, but, you know, I, I love them. As I said to the students, you guys, if you want, you could build a school in Nepal and go visit it. It only costs $35,000. And there was some kind of nervous chuckling. I go, 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 start with the alums. Start with the professors. Start there. And within like, I don't know, three weeks, they had raised money to build a school. And that was $35,000. And they're really proud of that. And hopefully that's going to continue a tradition year after year after year. Um, but I go to technology conferences. I go to um, investment banking conferences. And I just say, every one of you in this room who's educated, you would not be you without education. I would not be me. This is a chance to pay it forward. And $5,000 for a classroom library or $35,000 for a school or $250 for a girl to go to school, we've just gotten really good at kind of productizing pitching and we pitch persistently yeah it was actually when I when we talked I was impressed about the data and how like you use data and you've taken a lot of things that you've learned from like running in a business world and applied that to yeah. schools um, like you 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 know told me some statistics about like well if the girl lives like this far away then like you know this much cost for her bicycle or this much you know so you maybe you can tell us a little bit like data and how you guys yeah use that. Um, we're also a very data-driven company. It's like, interesting for it to see how you've applied this to, to, to building schools globally. Yeah, so we, um, you know, I'm a very big believer from my time in business that you know, what gets measured gets done. I know I'm preaching to the choir here on that one. So we try to measure every <laughs> single thing we do. And we're very that fortunate familiar. that we have some great supporters who help us do that. The Gates Foundation funds all of our, all of our evaluations, cross-program, cross-country, and under a six-year grant. So we can hire independent outside evaluators, right? You want to have independent evaluators, right? Because you don't want those, those evaluators should not be on your org chart reporting into you. They should be independent outsiders. They go out and they make random unannounced spot checks on our facilities, and they collect data. Is there a checkout system in place in the library? Are kids using it? How many books are going home with the kids? We do um, samples in the places where we do literacy training, assessments to see Sample schools which don't have a room to read library versus the schools that do have a room to read library. We just got a report last week from Bangladesh. And you know, you look at number of words per minute a child can read. Control school, a room to read school. Well, okay, that's great they're reading lots of words, so they comprehend. So you ask them some comprehension questions. How do they score at the control schools? How do they score at the room to read schools? Um, girls' education, we look at the percentage of girls who pass the next grade every year. A very simple assessment of whether it's working or not. But if you think about this for a minute, Right? If you're born a girl who's poor in a rural village in one of the world's 50 poorest countries to uneducated parents, you have five strikes against you. The world would expect you to fail. Yet, two years ago, 97% of our girls passed the next grade. Last year, it was 96%. We went out and did a survey last year to figure out what percentage of the girls who have finished secondary school, like what are they doing now? They finished secondary school, that's great. Now, what are they doing? We found that 64% of them are now enrolled in university or tertiary education. That is a rate of attainment higher than some schools in the developed world. And to be clear, we're not saying, congratulations, you've graduated secondary school. Here's your room to read college scholarship. We're saying, congratulations, you're on your own. Right? Good luck. Find the government scholarship scheme, work by day, go to school by night, or vice versa. And we've you know, worked with these girls on their life skills to help them give them the confidence that they're going and they're applying for these scholarships, or they're working. And they're in school, and I think that's great because that's really, you know, as we know, that's how middle class mm -hmm. begins to form when not just boys, but also with, when girls, you know, get educated and, and go to go on to university. Mm -hmm. um, but all of your schools are co-ed. Is that yeah. is that right? Yes. So maybe you can just tell us a little about philosophy there and why you think that's so important. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you look at the world today and you look at a situation like uh, Malala's in Pakistan, where girls are being, you know, harassed or shot for going to school, or you look at places in the world where you know, people are throwing acid, you know, on girls. I mean, it's really bad stuff happens all throughout the world. And my own personal belief in it is that a lot of the reason for that is that boys and girls just don't go to school side by side. They don't grow up in, you know, relatively normal circumstances where boys and girls are in the classroom together from kindergarten through grade one, through grade two, through grade three. And so the boys haven't really seen the girls achieve academically. And when all these girls are not in school, 
well, then society starts to really devalue yeah. the women and the girls because they didn't go to school. And I think we have to not just change this whole thing about you know women's empowerment. It can't be a women's issue. We've got to enl men. We've got to enlist in this battle for gender equality, not just because it's the right thing to do, right? I think it was Hillary Clinton who said it's not. It's not a women's issue. It's a human rights issue. But also, I think that when boys and girls go to school, so I know for, for myself, for, if somebody ever came up to me and said, women are dumb, women are inferior, I would have all this case data to reject that notion. My educated grandmother who read to me, God bless her, my educated mother, my educated older sister, all the girls in my school who kicked my butt academically and were top of the class, I don't think that boys and girls going to school, as I said, is going to solve every single problem. But I think if you actually have that be the new normal from, the great, from, from age five, that's going to do a lot to take these forces of misogyny and these forces of sexism and turn them around in a really, really significant way. Mm -hmm. You know, now that there's the internet, how do you think that's going to change books and libraries for schools globally? Like, I mean, logistically, it's probably going to be, I mean, you could imagine it could be easier. Um, uh -huh. Like you just like download the books, right? You don't actually have to ship them anymore. Um, mm. I mean, do you see like a world where you're actually installing digital libraries I, in all of these locations and like yeah, I just getting files? I think in the me I think in the medium term, yes. Uh -huh. But I think in the short term, we it's there's a risk of putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. And what I'll say that is, you know, different different things are going to work in different places based upon circumstances, right? You look at something like Khan Academy, absolutely fantastic. Um, but there's certain preconditions you have to have to actually have that be useful. Like it helps to have electricity, yeah. and it helps to have a computer, and it helps to have broadband, and, and it, you know, think, it helps to be literate. Yeah. So what Room to Read's doing is a lot of the stuff we're doing is kind of the early, really early stage foundational stuff of saying, let's get kids in from grade one to have really well-trained teachers, because at the end of the day, you, you want your kids to have good yeah. teachers. Let's have them have well-stocked libraries, Let's have literature in the mother tongue, because publishers don't publish books in languages read by predominantly poor people. We should talk about that yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, and you know, the reality is for us is we can open a library for about $5,000. Right? The average library serves 400 children. So you're looking at a cost of $12.5 per child reached. So the low-tech solution is actually really cost effective. Uh, books don't you know, need to be rebooted. Um, books don't have operating systems that, that you know, degrade. I mean, right. books, really a dollar a book for local language publishing, uh, it's a very, very cost-effective solution. Yeah. And for us, it's not only because, it's not only because we're Luddites, but, we, but it's really because we're working on some really deep foundational issues of, is a child literate? Is a child yeah. going to be able to learn to read? But once that happens, I think what ends up happening, those kids should be the same as, as, as I don't know to speak for any of you, but I'm platform agnostic, right? I love to read books. I love to read magazines. If I'm going on a long trip and I'm going to read the Steve Jobs bio, I'm likely to actually put it in my device because it's going to save me from carrying around a seven-pound book. But I think the key thing is literacy, habit of reading from a young age are preconditions for any technology solution to actually be able to work. And just think about this for yourself. If you hadn't gotten literate at a young age, odds are really strong you would not be working here. Yeah, sure. And I think we have to remind the world of that, just if I can say one Because <laughs> I've heard you're a tough interviewer. <laughs> No, but I do want to say that because yeah. I, do, I do want to remind people yeah. that 98% of the illiterate people in the world today are in the developing world. And we haven't totally cracked literacy in the developed world, but we've come really, really far. But in the developing world, you know, it's 49 out of 50 illiterate people live in the developing world. Yeah. One of the things I did not list in all of these accomplishments um, is the fact that in addition you're also publishing books. Yes. Yeah. In 20 languages. Right. Um, so, and you sort of alluded a little bit to this about needing to do that. So was it, like, maybe tell us a little bit more, like, why, why was it that you, like, in addition to becoming, like, creating libraries and schools, yeah. you also had to become a publisher? Yeah, so what happened to us was, in, in, in the new book, which, by the way, is on sale here today. See? <laughs> we practiced. Yes. Now, in the new book, one of my favorite chapters. Subsidize me, Google. <laughs> I know. That's, I'm, I'm stocking up, man. This, you, <laughs> you know, you guys get here at Google get this book cheaper than my author price. I have to pay Penguin $17 <laughs> a copy if I want to give a copy to my mom. You're getting it for 10 so I hope you stock up. Yeah. Arbitrage. Um, <laughs> where were we? Uh, okay, How sorry. you became a publisher. How you became a publisher, very apropos. Publisher. Hi, Paul. <laughs> 
Remind me, remind me to tell you my Paul Harr story at some point, too, of the, uh, of the interview. No, so what happened to us was that I, I wrote a chapter in this new book called Searching for Seuss. And the chapter's all about, how many of you are Dr. Seuss fans as kids? Oh, yeah, like 90% uh, for that question. So in the developing world, you actually can't find the equivalent of Dr. Seuss because the for-profit publishers don't want to publish books for children in languages where people live on less than $2 a day. And if you have $2 in your pocket, think about what if that was all you had for food, shelter, clothing, medicine. That's it. You don't have any money left over for books. So the for-profit publishers don't publish children's literature in Nepalese, Khmer, Laos, Zulu, Setswana, Zosa, Sinhalese, Tamil, Chhatrasgari, Rajasthani, Bengala. I can give you a really depressing list of, long list of languages. But this, for me, is like where the supply chain of poverty starts. Because if kids don't have books in their mother tongue, how are they going to grow up literate? And how are they going to grow up in a habit of reading? Well, we learned this because of that we were talking about you know, data collection. We, we, you know, what gets measured gets done. In 2003, we went out and asked our customers. We asked the little people, how are we doing? Well, what would cause you to use your libraries more often? Would it be you know, longer hours, open at night, open on weekends? The number one answer kids gave us, 52% of kids said more books in the mother tongue, more books in Nepalese, more books in Vietnamese. Well, that sounds like a giant no-brainer, right? Of course they want books in the language they speak at home. But the for-profit publishers don't publish because there's no profit incentive. So we looked at the data, and you know, room to read, we don't sit around and whinge or whine. Uh, we don't talk about problems. We act about solutions. And so we went out to the Skoll Foundation, and thank goodness Jeff Skoll is a, you know, has a team, and Sally Osberg have a team that takes risks. They gave us $100,000 to go search for Seuss, to go find the Dr. Seuss or the Dr.'s Seuss starting with Nepal, but eventually in other languages. And what we found was this absolutely incredibly creative community that existed in these countries, authors and artists with story ideas, but nobody had ever asked. Right? We found a group called the Nepalese Society for Children's Literature. We don't know what the heck they've been doing all those years, because they hadn't been really producing much children's <laughs> literature. <laughs> but we said, we have the money to produce 10 books. And within a month, our local team in Nepal had 67 manuscript ideas. So we already had a backlog of manuscript ideas. And so we basically decided we would become a, a publisher, not on a for-profit basis. And the thing we, we wanted to do, we said it, it would be easier to just translate existing children's books. Right? Let's, just, let's just, just overlay some Khmer script on Clifford the Big Red Dog. But we decided that we should actually do original literature, because what's, what's the point of having a book about the white Christmas so that kids in Zambia can be confused about caroling and eggnogs and snowflakes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, or have a book where you know mom drives up in the Volvo station wagon to the suburban ranch home and kids in Nepal and like don't know what a suburban yeah. ranch home is. So we so we become a publisher, local language, and those first ten books, right, from little things, big things grow. We've now published 850 original titles. Uh, we're going to publish our thousandth original title this year, and it's local, 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 local authors, local artists, local editors, and local content. Now, what's great about that then is we also control the printing presses, and it's literally one dollar per book. So we even have like you know ten year olds who for their birthday will say if everybody can give me ten dollars, room to read can produce a hundred books. Um, so the local language publishing thing took off from that, and it's great. I tell a story in the book. If I could just can you indulge sure, me in one more sure. quick story. One of my favorite stories in the sure. book, um, the new book is is called Baby Fish Goes to School, right? So if Searching for Seuss as a chapter was about the problem, Baby Fish Goes to School is a chapter where the solution comes up. And what happened is. Not just adults wanted to write children's books, but a lot of the students came up to us and said they had story ideas. And so in Sri Lanka, two teenage girls, 13 or 14 years old, came up with a concept that they wrote and illustrated called Baby Fish Goes to School. And it was all about a little fish who lives in the pond and every day watches the animals walking along the side of the pond going to school, sticks his head above the water and says, where do you guys go every day? And the horse says, we go to school, we love it. And the pig says, we sing songs and play games. And the chicken says, we get to eat curry and we get to dance and take naps and read books and Baby fish is like, wow, that's fantastic. I want to go to school. Well, that night tells its mother, and the mother says, you can't go to school. Why not? Well, the school's on land. And baby fish is like, OK, that totally sucks. That's a loose translation from the Tamil language. Um, and, um, but the animals, thankfully, are action-oriented optimists. right? They're not talking about the problem. They're acting on the solution. They go out, and maybe a bonus point for anybody who uh, guesses what they do. Yeah, exactly. You get the, uh, the bonus points are redeemable for absolutely nothing. But they, um, yeah, the animals buy a fish bowl. They scoop up baby fish. They walk baby fish to school, plunk them onto the chalkboard. Voila, baby fish goes to school. And I don't think you could have invented that story 
you know, kind of from, you know, an ivory tower where I live. It was the Sri Lankan teenage girls. And actually, one of them now, it's fantastic, the girl who illustrated it, is now in her third year of art college in Colombo. And still continues to ping me on Facebook with her updates. <laughs> I mean, on Google Plus. <laughs> you can actually look look her up if you if you actually bing her. <laughs> Come on, cheap tech humor. We're all friends. We're all friends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the ending was so funny. <laughs> I practiced that line in front of the mirror last night. Oh, I'm going to slay them with my Bing joke. <laughs> All right. So, what can um, what can everyone do to help? So, you know, you're the you work at a company here. You know, mm -hmm. what like everyone here in the room? You talked about you have different volunteer chapters. Like, what are the different ways for people to be involved and people to contribute to yeah. to the cause and the the movement that? I would, I would go back to the whole kind of, you know, time, treasure, talent are the three T's that nonprofits talk a lot about, right? So if you have talent, we can, we can put you to work. We're currently looking for somebody who can help us with YouTube APIs. Uh, and we need an expert in that to help our online marketing team. I'm not sure exactly what they need to do, but they asked me to pitch the fact that we need somebody who knows, uh, knows YouTube really well. Um, there's other talents, right? We have um, a great relationship with Salesforce.com. All of our projects reside up in the cloud under an all-you-can-eat free license for all 500 plus of our employees. It saves us so much money. But we actually have Salesforce engineers who volunteer their time. They're just down the street from us. They come in and they actually work with our team on our global, on our global solutions database. So talent, we need, we need talent. And my email is john at roomtreed.org. I'm happy to be the clearinghouse for you if you, have, if you have ideas on that. Getting involved in our fundraising chapters, right? We have these uh, you know, amazing fundraising chapters around the world. We would love to have a Google Plex fundraising chapter, right? Why not take some of your free time and say, you know what, let's just get our friends together. Let's use that company matching. Let's build a couple of libraries or a couple of schools somewhere in the developing world and maybe actually go visit them. And so turn that not just into philanthropy, but turn it into a travel opportunity. Maybe if you, you know, have kids or if you're, you want to do an adventure trip with your parents like I do with my parents on a regular basis, you can do that. And I would say, you know, I won't be shy. You have corporate matching. Uh, your stock's doing all right. It would be great to um, have more support um, from within Google. But other than, and there's you know, lots of other stuff. If you have ideas, pitch us on your ideas. If you have nieces, nephews, kids, we've got a great program called Students Helping Students. We'd love to get students involved in our work and inculcate them into a habit of philanthropy from a young age, which we think is great because it not only teaches kids to be philanthropic, but it also teaches them business skills, selling skills, social skills when those kids are going out and doing, doing fundraising events. So anything you can do, it's, if you have time, if you have treasure, if you have talent, we're, we're open to all of those things. Great. And what percentage of the funds go to the actual kids? Um, we actually deploy 83 cents in a dollar directly uh -huh. to programs. We are a charity, I don't think you guys know Charity Navigator. It's kind of like the SEC um, of the fundraising world. And they give from one to four stars. And we've received four, consec four stars every single year they've rated us, which is the seven, sec seven consecutive years they've been around. Uh, and only 2% of nonprofits in America have achieved seven consecutive years of Charity Navigator four-star ratings. So at 83 cents in the dollar, we're amongst the elite. And you know, one of the questions we get is, well, how do you do that, right? Because you can't run on no overhead, right? You got to have, I mean, having a CFO is considered overhead, but you got to have a CFO or else you're going to turn into one of these silly nonprofits that unravel because they have no financial control. So the question for me about overhead is always, you know, overhead's a bit like cholesterol. I think there's good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol. This is there's good overhead and bad overhead. So we've done all kinds of creative things. I talk in the book about a, uh, the, one of the chapters in the book is called No Range Rovers, The War on Overhead. And it's all about saying, let's not spend money on these shiny $75,000 vehicles that aid workers love to drive around in or be driven around in by their driver. Let's eliminate that expense because of 75,000. Who's good at math here? We're at Google, right? Who's good at math? Come on, don't be shy. Come on, Paul Hart. Good, I'm going to put Paul on the spot. <laughs> So, Paul, a Range Rover in Cambodia costs $75,000. We can print one local language book for a dollar. How many books do we sacrifice? <laughs> this is your warm-up question. I'm going to take a rough guess at somewhere around $75,000. Perfect. OK. Second question. A girls' education, a girls' scholarship for one year costs $250. How many girls don't go to school this year if we buy five Range Rovers? <laughs> Too slow for that 
How about, okay, how, how many girls don't go to school for you by one? 300. 300. Oh my gosh, you guys need to hire me. I'm good. I'm better at math. <laughs> no, kidding. Sorry, Paul. Oh, but um, 300 girls. So if you buy like five Range Rovers per country, but you open, you're working in 10 grand, like we are literally, you're cheating tens of thousands of girls out of education. So we basically looked at it and said, let's figure out every single way we can save money. So one day I was in a board meeting, and one of uh, my mentors, Munir Sauter, a uh, Goldman banker, was telling me that he's been flying so much that he had 3 million miles on American Airlines. And I kind of wait, you know, rubbed my hands together greedily and said, what's your password? <laughs> and he gave it to me, and I ran him down. I ran him down. He's got zero miles in his account right now. Right, because I wanted to fly around the world for free. And I told that story at the Barclays Asia Forum, and all these Barclays bankers said, we're competitive with Goldman, we're going to compete mile for mile. Every time they donate a mile, we're going to donate a mile. Well, then we needed hotel rooms, because you don't just want to fly for free, you want to stay for free. So Nikki from our team in um, San Francisco, they closed a deal. Cindy and, and Nikki closed a deal. Um, 150 free room nights from Hilton per year. Well, we needed office space where we raised money. Tokyo, London, Sydney, Hong Kong, those are expensive cities to open offices in. Credit Suisse said, fine, we're just going to give you some desk space. And so they're a landlord. We don't pay them a cent. Actually, they pay us every year through a grant. So we get a grant every year, but also we get, and that's kind of when I said, you know, the time treasure talent. Maybe one of your talents here in this room is figuring out how to help us to save money. This year, Lenovo has a deal with Room to Read. Um, they're giving us 500 laptops. So every single employee around the world will have a brand new laptop. Now think about that for a second. At $1,000 plus a laptop, every laptop represents four years of girls' education. So in a certain sense, I'm really lucky that I grew up with uh, parents who were like, on a really tight budget, because my parents always taught me to make the dollar go as far as possible. And there's so many examples in the book of how we do that. And I think so no matter what your cause or what your passion, definitely read that chapter and share it with boards you're on, because there's so many ways the nonprofit world can save money on, ex on overhead so that more money goes to the programs. They just have to build that muscle of constantly asking people for favors. How many miles do you have, by the way? Uh, yeah, we discussed actually my miles. Um, yeah, he, he's, he's very true to his word. So yeah, and when we met, that was one of the questions. So yes, I, we're, work, we're working on, on donating some of my miles. Um, I have a lot. Good. Um, um, which airline? So, no, I'm uh, <laughs> yes, I do. American. Oh, I, told, I actually I told that story once in Hong Kong, and somebody in the audience was like, you know, they're 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 flying on, you know, in Hong Kong they're flying on Cathay and they're flying on Singapore Airlines, and someone goes, oh my God, he had to fly three million miles on American Airlines. <laughs> I think other people here have a few questions, um, so I don't want to be a hog. Um, we have a a microphone. Hey, I just had a quick question. Well, no, I have several questions that kind of interrelate. Um, first being, who are these teachers that are in your school? Were they kind of in the community before? Were they trained as teachers? Or are they just coming out of grade 12, which is very yeah. often the case? Um, and then also- Can I answer that question yeah, first? Yeah, sure. I, I only have so much brain power. So, um, so we actually, one of our gating criteria for countries that we work in, along with provinces or districts within a country, is do they have, does the Ministry of Education kind of have its act together in terms of teacher training colleges? And are there enough trained teachers coming out that we'll be able to actually put them into the schools? And will the government actually pay those teachers' salaries? Because everything we do is under a tripart agreement where Room to Read helps to build the school. The community donates the labor. But the Ministry of Education actually supplies the teachers and pays their ongoing salaries. So it's really, uh, for us, the Ministry of Education partnership is a really critical part of what we do. Now, we also then do additional um, uh, workforce development for, te I don't like to use the word training, but you know, kind of professional development for teachers. So we actually work with them on how do you run an effective library? How do you get kids in a habit of reading? How do you teach kids to decode words? How do you teach kids to learn script like Khmer? So we're doing a lot of literacy training, writing training, habit of reading, and librarian <laughs> training also to kind of top up the skills those teachers have. Great, I think that answered several of my questions too. But in addition to that, I, so you're working mainly with government schools, and I know at least in Zambia, I have firsthand experience with a lot of community schools, which are on the rise um, and you know basically cost way less than government schools. Um, but 
you get more teachers that are coming out of grade 12. Um, you get, you know, far more undertrained teachers that don't necessarily get paid enough to have the motivation yeah. to, um, you know, teach as well or to be as dedicated to their students. So it, do you see kind of like a movement in that direction for Room to Read or, ha you know, is that on the horizon? Not, not, not really because um, I mean, I've, I've done as much study as I can, and I've read James Tooley's book, and you know Fernando Reimers from the Harvard Graduate School of Education sits in our board, so we've kind of looked at all this stuff. But the problem with the kind of the community school approach that's happening in the developing world is there hasn't really been any organization, and if I'm wrong, please tell me and email me. The, but that's actually scaled in a significant way, right? So you have a lot of these little community-run schools, but but almost none of them have actually scaled beyond a certain number of locations. And what we're about at Room to Read is really about scale, but scale with quality, but also to be sustainable. And the only way these schools will be sustainable, in our experience in the long run, is if the community is signed up to run them, but the government is also signed up to continue to support them. So as you get more students coming in and you need more teachers. So our, our investor doesn't have to, to have the ongoing costs of paying the teachers. The government actually is building that into their budget. And that lets us actually leverage that local government's money. So I guess one of my questions was, kind of around, well, one of the things that struck me in reading the first book was how important having a focus on results was. I know you put a lot of the results, you published them in your email signature, and you made it very prominent. And in kind of looking at a lot of the other nonprofits, it, it seems that one of the things that helped you guys succeed tremendously was your first-hand business experience and then translating that focus on results and efficiency to the nonprofit world. Do you think, you know, for a lot of the nonprofits that are kind of focusing on efficiency gains and trying to kind of improve their operations. Do you think it's as easy to help those organizations improve as just having more business-oriented people apply their knowledge to the nonprofit world, or do you think there's more of a systematic shift? You talked a little bit about yeah. expenditures and some of those kind of... <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I think, the, yeah, so the, qu the question was, um, Basically, like, you've had a lot of success because of being very data-driven and from experience that you've had from coming from the business world. And um, so the question was... So there's a little bit about, how, you know, do you think that you need more people from the business do world? Do you need more people yeah. from the business world in order to have, the, have nonprofits be able to benefit from some of those business skills? I, I think it helps, but I, I should also give like, full credit to the fact that a lot of our staff have trained in, you know, in education. And you can't have too many business people. Right, you have to have people who actually have trained as educators, who have trained, have pedagogical ideas, who have trained about what are the issues for girls and women to keep them in school. So too many business people probably would, would be a bad idea, uh, but I think too few is also a bad idea. So my hope is that more and more people in the business world get in and say, okay, we're going to make sure that we actually have, and, and a lot of the stuff the business people do is like kind of like the boring stuff, right? It's like we have to have an audit committee. Right? Have I put you to sleep yet? Right? But you have to have an audit committee because you have to audit early. You have to audit often. If there's financial malfeasance, you've got to find it. You've got to cut it off at the source. And so there's a lot of stuff that I think business leaders can do in the nonprofit space that will help the whole sector to be more efficient. And that I think the more efficient the sector is, you know, I think the pie will grow. Because if, if people see inspiring examples, and it could, be, you know, it could be Kiva, it could be Charity Water, it could be Room to Read, as people see those things that work, I think more money gets attracted in. Um, the ones that don't work, very well are doing a disservice to the rest of us because that makes it e too easy for the cynics to be cynical if they see one more nonprofit that's kind of playing hanky panky with their books. So I think there's a, definitely a role for more business people, uh, but also I think we just can't forget the fact that you also need people who have actually trained. Like I'm not an educator, um, so we better have a lot of those in our team or else we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Is this, okay, um, so kind of going off of that, I think there's tons, the beautiful thing is that there's tons and tons of nonprofits out there kind of working towards a great mission, but sometimes they can overlap and work towards the same mission. So what do you feel um, kind of separated Room to Read to allow you to scale, to kind of stand uh, out and really be successful compared to some people that are also working towards literacy? Yeah, well actually I can, I can play on that question because a, a lot of our success at Room to Read is because we have found really clever ways to partner with other NGOs. I think there's way too much reinvention of the wheel in this sector, right? There's 1.2 million um, NGOs registered in America alone. And like, I know like 90% of them run on budgets of less than a quarter million dollars a year. So think about the duplication there, that every one of them needs to balance their bank statement and publish an annual report and have a website. And I think many times if NGOs find smart ways to work together, you can get a lot more done. I'll give you just two quick examples of that. When Room to Read launched in Hamanchal, uh, Hamanchal, no, sorry, Uttaranchal in northern India. 
there was a group called Shirag, the Central Himalayan Rural Action Group. They had opened over 100 schools, uh, but none of their schools had libraries, or very few of their schools had functioning libraries. So we said, great, this is fantastic. You've, you've put down these schools that might have cost $40,000 to $50,000 to build. On a $5,000 budget, we can come in and put in a library and make your schools more effective. Another one, how many of you have heard of the, the Girl Rising film that's coming out next month? So we are one of the participants in Girl Rising. And in this film, they profile a girl named Suma, who was formerly a household slave in Nepal. They have this terribly oppressive system called the Kamlari system, where lower caste girls are sold into indentured servitude to be household servants for the middle class. Their parents get a payment of like $20 per year, just sickening to me. Um, but these girls deserve to be freed. Well, we wanted to be part of that, because there's a movement now to say that's barbaric, you know, ninth century practice. Let's get beyond it. But we don't know how to do that. But thankfully, there's a group in Nepal called the Nepalese Youth Opportunity Foundation. Som Panera runs it, fantastic guy I've known for years. They know how to do it. So they went out and agitated, and they started freeing these girls, 100, 200, 300, 400. Well, what do you do with the 9-year-old or 10-year-old who's never gone to school? Well, if she wants to go to school, we better get her in school. So we basically did a partnership where they free, we educate. It's a bit more complicated than that, but let's just keep it simple. They free, we educate. We went out, and I pitched a banker. Uh, at Barclays, he said, my wife and I will fund every single girl you can get in that. Don't stop at 400, don't stop at 500, don't stop at 600. Today, over 700 girls have been freed through that partnership. So NYOF frees them, Room to Read educates them. And one of the girls, Suma, who will be featured in the Girl Rising film, uh, last, just about over a year ago, um, there was a, a film that was shot. The Girl Rising film got shown to Tina Brown, who runs the Women in the World Conference. And in the film, Suma was singing a song she wrote to her parents to say, uh -huh. Why do you educate your sons but oppress your daughters? And she, the song was about expressing to her parents her feelings about don't ever do this to me again. Well, Tina Brown saw the film, or somebody on Tina's staff, I don't know, saw the film. So we need Suma to come to New York and sing her song to open the Women in the World Conference. It was incredible. She sang in Nepalese. There were the super titles like in the opera. She wow. brought down the house. Well, then somebody from the State Department saw it and said, well, Secretary Clinton's staff has suggested that Suma should come back and end the conference on the same note and re-sing that song. So in our office in New York, where I work out of, we have these photos of Suma, who three and a half years ago was a household slave. And here she is with Meryl Streep. Here she is with Chelsea Clinton. Here she is with Sheryl Sandberg. Here she is with Hillary Clinton. And I just love that, you know, kind of like, just like that gyrus, here you've got Suma. That's the potential these kids have to just blow us all away. So anyway, long answer to a short question, but that's, I think, the power of NGOs finding ways to work together. Upon this, in your answer just now about uh, slavery in Nepal, but I'm curious to hear how you deal with cultural issues whereby, particularly in terms of women, where they're discouraged from learning, they're discouraged from going to school, they're discouraged from uh, being involved in public life, um, how you partner or how you overcome some of those challenges, particularly where there's violence directed uh, against those who are trying to buck this trend? Yeah, I think the, the, the key thing for us is that some of the most heroic employees at Room to Read are local women. We call them, their titles are social mobilizers. Right, and they're well-educated Zambian women, Tanzanian women, Nepalese women, Cambodian women. And that's exactly what they do. They socially mobilize. They go out, they kind of agitate in the community. They find out what are the barriers to education. But many times we've found the barriers are not really attitudinal. Many times we find the barriers are actually financial, which is great because that's a really easy problem to solve. Um, there's other barriers. We, we were, our, our team in India was working in a, a, a certain province where a number of districts, they couldn't find almost any girls who had ever made it past grade nine. And they thought originally, well, this might be some kind of like cultural thing, but it actually wasn't. It was just, it was a Muslim community, and the parents didn't feel comfortable sending their, their daughters to a school, the high school, because they didn't have any female teachers. And they didn't want their daughters to be in a place without female teachers. Well, again, that's an easy problem to solve. Our team went to the Ministry of Education and said, we need to put female teachers in these schools, because if we do, the girls will stay in nine, 10, 11, grade 12. And within a year, over 500 girls in all these different villages were now enrolled in grades 9 and 10. Um, I tell a story in the book about, um, just really quickly, about Rima Shrestha, our girls, one of our um, girls' education program officers in Nepal. In 2008, we were on a visit with her. And I said, Rima, what's, you know, what's good about Room to Read in Nepal? What's bad about Room to Read in Nepal? And she said, John, I was so excited in January. I got our budget approved. I was told that we could add 500 girls to the program this year. 
She thought, wow, 500 lives changed. What a humongous yeah. number. She was so excited. And she went out and to our network of NGO partners, to our government partners, said, you know, we have 500 positions. She had 4,000 applications within a month. And she said, John, do you know what it feels like to turn down 3,500 girls? And I said to her, do you know what it makes me feel like? It makes me feel like a failure. Because you should not be in the business, Rima, of saying no. Or even not yet. You should be in the business of saying yes. And I'll, I'll end on that note, because I think that yes is a beautiful word. And I would like to invite all of you, you know, we're really, I go back to this thing I said earlier. I don't want to be the leader of an organization. I want to be one of many, many, many leaders of a global movement. And so I do hope that all of you will, uh, will get involved and hopefully join us. And if you do want to hear a good story about how we chose the name Room Tree, I know we're out of time, but grab Paul Har because he hosted a dinner party at which several bottles of wine and several smart friends came together, and that's how we came up with, with the brand. And if you've not read Leaving Microsoft to Change the World, there's actually a little vignette called The Name Game, which is all about Paul and Susan hosting this party. And I was proposing we call the organization Books Ahoy, because we were like sending <laughs> books overseas. And um, Paul convinced me that was a really terrible brand name. <laughs> So again, thank you for, I know how okay. busy you are, so thank okay. you for being no, here. Thank you, Paul. Th thank you, Tom, so much for, and Paul. Thank you.